So glad to have you here with us this morning. I hope you've come ready to sing. Will you please stand and join us?
So I pray that everyone here has an expectant heart. I believe that you will bless us when we come into this place expecting something, expecting a miracle, expecting to be a blessing to someone near us, Father. Help us look for those opportunities where we can be an encouragement to those around us. We thank you, God, for allowing us to come into this place and worship you together, Father. I pray for this service. I pray for every person here. Please use this, God. Please, I pray you'll be proud of our praise and pleased with it that we are giving our best to you, God. I pray for our pastor as he brings the sermon. We pray for Sherry as she leads Children's Church. We pray for our nursery, for toddlers, everything that's going on in this place, Father. So many wonderful things happening. And Father, at this time, we ask you, will you please bless this offering? I pray that every gift that's given be done with a joyful heart, Father. We're just giving back a portion of what you've given to us and blessed us with. Help us to always remember to count our blessings. We love you, God, and you're in pray. Amen. You may be seated.
So I'd like to give you a challenge. Some people during our fellowship time, I mean, you just make your way all over the sanctuary. But some, you just stand in one spot and you greet those that are closest to you. But a lot of times we sit in the same place every week. So it's not really an opportunity to at least say hi and shake hands with someone maybe that you do not know. So we have a rule for today, a challenge. You cannot shake the hand of anyone in your section until you leave your section and shake someone else's hand. Now, we're probably going to get three log jams right in the middle of the aisle, and that is fine. So, we are now going to have a time of fellowship. Please greet those around you.
what you are doing. If you'll close your eyes during this part, just put a hand out, another, both hands out. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you don't have to at all. And no one will know because they're supposed to have their eyes closed. So let's just worship God all together today. I think God is so pleased when he feels praise and worship from one of us, but from us as a group, worshiping together, it has to thrill his soul. So Adrian's gonna start us in this. She'll lead us, sing with her, close those eyes, and let's worship God. It is well. It can be well in their 
your circumstances. God, I pray that the truth of the other songs that we just declared to you this morning will take over their life. And, and Father, we will realize that it is not well because of us. It is not well because of what we bring to the table. But God, it is well because you're sovereign. Because you are in control. Because whatever shattered our life did not take you by surprise at all. God, so this morning, for all of us, hopefully, we find our wellness in you. God, we realize that maybe we don't have control over the situation, and this is far beyond what we could handle. But God, it's well because of you, because you are eternal. whatever is going on in our life doesn't change your glory at all. You are still on your throne. So Father, that's our our hope this morning is in that. So Lord, if we came in and, and we had a heavy heart or had a lot on our mind, Lord, I pray that as we leave here, we gain a new perspective to declare even just inwardly, God, it's okay. Not because of me, but because of you. So Father, that as we move forward, as, as we face the challenges of this week, of this month, of this year, God, some of us are chasing, facing the challenges of a lifetime. Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you this morning. Those of you that are our guests today, we're so delighted to have you and uh, pray that uh, the the service so far has been meaningful to you. We are so grateful that you've joined us for this time of worship and pray that you'll just now focus your attention on God's Word. If you have a bulletin with you, inside that bulletin there's a listening guide that has our scripture for this morning. If you happen not to pick up a bulletin as you came in, you can open your Bible to Mark chapter 8. We're going to be looking at several verses from Mark chapter 8. Before we dive into the scripture, let me tell you that as Mark begins this gospel, the very first verse that he writes to us says that here begins the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let me ask you this morning as we begin, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, let's confess that together. Jesus is the Son of God. I started without you, didn't I? Okay, everybody ready this time? Now, we need to let the folks over at First Baptist know that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So, loud enough they can hear us. Everybody ready? Jesus is the Son of God. Well, I don't know if they heard it or not, but I'll tell them you said that. You confessed it. Mark chapter 8, we find a, uh, a wonderful story. And really today, Mark wants to throw at us the question, how well do you see Jesus? How well do you see Jesus? Now, I don't know how things are going to work out in this service, but in the last service, you're not going to have to listen long, but you're going to have to listen hard. Can you listen hard? Do you know the difference between the kind of listening and listening hard? If you hang with me uh, for just a few minutes, we're going to get through this passage of Scripture, but Mark lays out a very long passage of Scripture with us, and he asks us this question. 
How well do you see Jesus? Let's dive in. Mark chapter 8. Now, I'm not actually going to read through this, but I'm going to kind of walk through it. So you follow along. I hope to keep you up by telling you what verse I'm talking about. But in verse number 1, we find where there's a large crowd of people gathered, and the people have run out of food. Verse number two tells us that Jesus really feels sorry for the people. He has great compassion on them, and he's feeling sorry for them, for they have been following him for three days. Now, can you imagine following with Jesus for three days? For some of you in this room this morning, sitting through an hour-long worship service is pretty tough. Can you imagine following Jesus for three days. Every once in a while, somebody will tell me that you're a preacher. You only work one hour a week. And usually the people that tell me that are the same people that get mad when I go over that one hour. They get mad about the one hour, but they don't want me working no overtime. That's funny. Everybody laugh. Let me know you're still with me. Okay. But some of you that are concerned about the hour, you say, but preacher... We've got to eat. We've got to beat First Baptist or the Methodist Church to the restaurants. Well, Jesus feels your pain. Notice the very next thing that he said. He feels sorry for the people for they've been with him for three days and they had nothing to eat. Anybody bring a snack with you when you came this morning? Well, that's where these people are. Jesus is very concerned. He knows they have to eat. The Bible says so he began to talk to the disciples about how are we going to feed them. If he sent them away, they might faint on the road home. So verse number four, how the disciples asked Jesus, how are we supposed to find enough food? And notice once again, this story happens out in a wilderness. How are we going to find food out here? There's no stores. There's nowhere we can get food. How are we going to, how are we supposed to come up with food out here in the wilderness? Verse five, Jesus says, well, how many loaves of bread do you have? And the disciples say, well, there's seven. And drop down, if you would, to verse number eight. Jesus multiplies the bread just as he had done before. And there were some fishes in the mix. And the Bible says that all of them ate until they were full. They all ate until they were satisfied. They all ate and had enough nourishment that they could make the journey back home. And after they had eaten, the Bible says that verse number eight, they gathered up seven large baskets that were left over. Verse number nine, Mark wants us to know how many people were in this crowd. There were about 4,000 there. Notice if you would the end of verse number 10. He sent them home after they had eaten. He wanted to make sure everyone could feel good as they made their journey back home. Verse 10, immediately after this, he got in the boat and his disciples, and they crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. Verse number 11, not long after being in the region of Dalmanutha, there was some Pharisees that learned that he was in the area, and so they wanted to go and talk with Jesus. But if you notice the New Living Translation here, it says they really wanted to meet with him so they could argue with him. They wanted to put him to the test. As a matter of fact, most every version that you would look at of this verse says they met with him to test him. Now notice the test. They wanted to see if he could pass. They wanted to test him to see if he really was from God. And so they demanded of him. (laughs) Now if he's from God... Just what do you have to have inside to demand of God that you prove to us who you are? Here are people who really want to command God. God, if you're really God, here's what I want you to do in my life. Now, Mark is writing not to the disciples, not to the Pharisees. 
He's writing to a church of people or a body of people somewhat like us who gather to learn more and learn how to live this Christian life and how we go about doing all this stuff that God would have us to do. But Mark is showing us that there are actually people who would come into the presence of God and demand that God do a particular thing. Now notice what they are demanding of God. They ask God to give them a sign uh, so that they could prove who he was. Now, when Jesus heard this, he sighed deeply. Everybody sigh. Okay, now, when Jesus is confronted with these, I mean, these Pharisees, what do you think is going on inside of him? Do you think this is a confrontational moment? Do you think Jesus may be just a little bit tense with these disciples? What do you think Jesus is encountering as these Pharisees meet with him and demand that he prove himself to be from God? Okay, now, with that kind of thinking on board... Let's sigh again. It kind of changes, doesn't it? What do you think Jesus is experiencing? Notice, if you will, that they have asked Jesus a question, and now Jesus is going to question them. How, why do you people keep demanding a miraculous sign? Notice what he tells them. I assure you, I will not give this generation any sign. Now, I have to be honest with you and tell you that this situation really seemed to kind of bug Jesus. I mean, it really got under his skin. As you follow this story along, you begin to sense that Jesus really had this on his mind. Have you ever had something that kind of, somebody said something and got something started on your mind and you thought about it while you're driving down the road? Matter of fact, you couldn't hardly go to sleep at night because you had this whatever it is on your mind. Somebody has gotten under your skin. Somebody's put a burr under your saddle. And all of a sudden, whatever they have stirred up in you, you just keep it on your mind. You can't get it off your mind. That's all that you think about. Well, that is actually what's happening with Jesus. Look back, if you would, verse, I mean, look down at verse 13. So he got back into the boat and he left them and he crossed over to the other side of the lake. But the disciples discovered, discovered that they had forgotten to bring any bread. And there was only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. Now, they had just like walked off and left seven full baskets of bread. Very full baskets of bread. But when they get on the boat and they're doing all this crossing of the lake, they suddenly realize they only had one loaf of bread with them. And as they were crossing the lake, verse 15, Jesus warned them. You ever thought about what Jesus sounded like in all of these different places? A while ago, you was thinking about the sigh when he was in a confrontation with the, uh, with the uh, Philistines, um, with the Pharisees. They just well be Philistines, I guess. In his confrontation with the Pharisees, we sighed. But here, Jesus is going to warn them sternly. Jesus warns them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and beware of the yeast of Herod. Now they decided among themselves that he was saying this because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what he was thinking. So Jesus said to the disciples, here again, gear yourself up because Jesus is about to start questioning these disciples. Why do you worry about having no food? Why is it you get worried? Because you have no food. You ever get worried when God doesn't do things exactly the way you want him to? You ever get worried when you have this plan and somehow it doesn't turn out like you think it would? Remember the Pharisees challenged him, Make, show us some proof that you really are who you are. Now the disciples, they seem to be in the same way. They're, they're thinking, we know what Jesus is thinking. So Jesus asked them, why do you worry that you have no food? Won't you ever learn 
Won't you ever understand? And then he asked them the hard question. Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You ever find yourself in a situation where your heart's just too hard to listen? I remember when my kids were young. They're both sitting here today, so I'm going to talk about them. Well, one of them's done left. He knew it was coming. But my kids sometimes, I, you know, I, I was not the best dad in the world. And we get into confrontations, and sometimes I just meant I was going to have my way. Of course, to them, it didn't make any sense. And it didn't make any difference how much I tried to talk to them about why I was doing it. Their hearts would just be hard, and I could tell they just weren't listening to what I was trying to say. They just weren't willing to learn what I was trying to teach them about life. They just weren't open to what I was trying to say. And Jesus has is, is, is found the very same thing with the disciples. He finds that their hearts are really hard. And they, they're just not at the place where they can begin to understand just who Jesus is. I mean, they, they see him doing all of these miracles. They, they watch and, and they, they witness it. They have a front row seat to what God is doing through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the very Son of God. But Jesus said, guys, you're missing it. I mean, you just don't get it. You're, you're not really tracking with what God says. And notice, if you would, that he quotes from Scripture and he actually says, you have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. I've wrestled with this passage of Scripture for several weeks now. And uh, one of the things that I've done, and actually did this several, several months ago as I you know, was just sort of thinking about the Gospel of Mark. I asked God to help me start really listening as he would speak to me. I ask God to help kind of open my eyes where I could see all that he is doing. That's been amazing. This past Friday, I had one of the most interesting days that I've had in quite some time. I had an experience. I, I finished up my message for tonight, and then I went and visited one of our ladies. I was going to visit someone else, and I called, and they weren't home. So I went on over to this other place, and I visited and while I was there, the most incredible thing happened. You just you had to have been there to see it. Y'all want me to tell you about it? Okay, I'm going to talk about it tonight. So y'all come back at 6 o'clock, and, and I'll tell you all about it. But I had prayed that God would open my eyes so that I could see. And I want to tell you, God is at work in this part of the world. God is at work in many of your lives. And folks, I have to tell you, God is working in this place. But we have to open our eyes so we can see. Now, I'm not perfect at it. I'm telling you, I am not. I am just learning. God still catches me off guard. I feel, still find my way stumbling through, seeing all that God would have us to see. Sometimes I hear God speak. I'll be reading his word. <laughs> Stuff that I have read, I don't know how many times. And all of a sudden, God will just speak right out from his word. Many of us in this room today, we have eyes, but we're not really watching. We have ears, but we're not really listening. And God wants to shake us this morning and say, can't you see? Can't you see? How well do you see Jesus as the Son of God. Now, notice Jesus continues with his questioning. Uh, you have eyes and can't see. You have ears and can't hear. Don't you remember anything at all? Notice he gets very specific now. What about the 5,000 loaves? I fed with five loaves of bread. How many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterwards? They said 12. He said, well, what about the feeding of the 4,000? How many, uh, when I used seven loaves of bread, how many large baskets of leftover did you pick up? And they said, seven. Look at verse 21. Don't you understand even yet? Now, 
I want you to be careful to listen. If you kind of lost track with me, I hope that you'll get back on track with me for this next few verses, beginning in verse 22. Because Mark is going to punch every one of us right where we live. Mark wants to ask you, how well do you see Jesus? Look at verse 22. Well, they arrived back at Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch and heal the man. Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village, and then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid hands on him, and he asked him, can you see anything now? And Jesus and the man looked around, and he said, why, yes, yes, I see. I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands over the man's eyes again. And the man stared very intently in the, and his sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. Now, let me, let me clarify. Mark is not writing to the disciples. Mark is not writing to this man who Jesus had to touch twice so he could see clearly. Mark is writing to people like us who gather in groups to hear a worship time and to hear a message read. Mark is writing to people who are trying to figure out this thing of Christianity. Or Mark is writing to people who've started the journey and they need to be growing. And he's writing to tell this story to them. And he has these disciples who just can't see it. They have eyes but can't see. They have ears but can't hear. And so Mark says, when I write this story, I'm going to put this story of the blind man right here. Just so folks like us will know that every once in a while, we need to ask Jesus just to touch me again so that I can see what you want me to see. May I ask you, would you spend some time just praying and asking God, Lord, would you touch my eyes so that I could see? Some of you, you're kind of there, aren't you? I mean, you see God doing some things, but you really can't see clearly what he wants you to see. You, you kind of hear God's voice, but you're not really sure what all of that means. You come in here to a worship service. I got to tell you, I, I really felt God's presence as we were worshiping this morning. And you, you sing these songs and that message just sort of gets in your heart and suddenly the message of that song just sort of sets fire to your soul and you're all excited, but you're not really sure what he wants you to do with all of that excitement. I'm going to ask you this week just to pray. Lord, would you help me see clearly? Would you help me hear closely? Would you help me know exactly what you're wanting me to do? When I, I feel, I, I sense as I read your word that you're speaking to me, you're guiding me, I, I sense as we worship that there's a word in there for me, would you open my eyes this week so that I can see what, you, what it is that you want me to do? Would you be willing to do that? Just pray and say, Lord, help me see. Lord, Help me to listen. I know you want to touch my life. Now, uh, the Bible says that, uh, verse, drop down to verse 29. The Bible says that uh, the Lord asked them, who do people say that I am? And Peter, he gets it right. He says, you are the Messiah. And as he talked about this openly uh, with the disciples, down in verse 32, Peter took him aside. Now, let me, I skipped a part here. Jesus is telling, going to tell them about his, how he's going to die. He's going to rise from the dead, but he's going to die first. Well, when Peter hears that, just after telling him that he's the Messiah, Jesus uh, takes, uh, well, after Peter hears that Jesus is going to die, Peter just looks at Jesus and he says, uh, told him, this, you shouldn't be talking like this, Jesus. 
look, you're, you're upsetting the other disciples. Don't be talking about your death. Now, Peter had just told him that he was the Messiah. But look at verse number 33. Jesus turned and looked at the other disciples. And he said to Peter very sternly, he meant this. He was looking him right in the eye. And he told him very sternly, get away from me, Satan. You're, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view. And you're not seeing what God wants to do. You ever find yourself in that situation? I mean, you, you really want to see things, but you find yourself only looking at things the way we normally see things. And you're not seeing what God wants to do in our lives. Now, think about Peter for just a minute. Three times he's going to deny that he knows the Lord Jesus Christ before this story is over. But... On the day of Pentecost, it was Peter that saw things clearly. For the first time, maybe, he really saw it. And he preached as a guy that was full of conviction of what God could do. He was not seeing things from a manly point of view. He was seeing things from God's perspective. And on that day, he preached the word of God. And 3,000 people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he said. Now, verse number 30, the Bible says that Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about this. A couple of weeks ago, I reminded you that that was before we get to the end of the book. By the end of the book, Mark is telling us to tell everybody we know and tell it everywhere we go. Tell people what Jesus has done for you. Tell people what Jesus can do for you and do for others. So once again, I want to ask you this question. How well do you see Jesus? Do you really see him as the Son of God? Do you see him as the Son of God? Do you see him as the Son of God who came into the world to make a difference in the world? Folks, I believe our world needs someone that can make a difference in our world. I'm at the stage of life when I look at the world, I just, it just terrifies me, even for myself. But I'm about to have another granddaughter in September. I have a granddaughter now, and when I think about the world that they will grow up into, it really sort of scares me. It makes me wonder, what is going to happen once I've left this scene? Do you really believe that Jesus is the Son of God and do you believe that he came into this world to make a difference in this world? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus came into this world to make a difference in the world and that he wants to make a difference in your life? Not only does he want to make a difference in the world out there, he wants to make a difference in your life right here. As a matter of fact, in order to make a difference out there, he may want to do a difference in here so he can use me to make a difference out there. Yesterday, we celebrated 50 years since mankind had gone to the moon. Three men who had the courage to go and to do what had never been done before, where man had never gone before. When mankind went to the moon, there was all the technology that they had at their availability. The greatest technology in all of history sent man to the moon. And if you have a cell phone in your pocket, you have greater technology with you right now than they had at that particular point in time. Isn't that amazing? God keeps giving us great gifts because he wants us to be just like those men who went to the moon. They worked and they trained. They worked hard. They were willing to give all that they had. Their lives were all about going to the moon. What are you training for? What are you living for? Where are you wanting to go with your life? Is it worth it to listen 
Is it worth it to hear, to see what God may want to do in my life? Look at verse 31. Very quickly as I close. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man was going to suffer many terrible things. Do you know why he was suffering terrible things? To pay for my sin. Pay for your sin. Notice verse 31. He was rejected by the leaders and the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. Those who should have known who he was. Those that called themselves working for God, and yet here was the Son of God, and they were rejected him. Why would he go through that? Because he loved me, and he loved you. And notice the next line. He would be killed. The worst kind of death a man could die, and Jesus endured that. Because he knew I needed forgiveness for my sin. But that's not the end of the story. Three days later, he would rise again. Everybody look right here for just a second. How well do you see Jesus? Do you see somewhat Jesus? Do you see in Jesus someone who can make a difference in this world? Do you see someone who can not only make a difference in the world, but he can make a difference in your life? Do you see someone who can make a difference in your life to the point that you are making a difference in someone else's life for eternal good? How well do you see Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I pray for each person in this room. And Lord, if there is someone here today that has never come to faith in Christ, I pray in the closing moments of this service that you'd help them to see that Jesus is the hope of the world. I, want, I, I pray that somehow they might understand that Jesus came to forgive them of their sin. Help them to be born into the family of God. And Lord, if there's someone here today that's never made that decision, I pray in the closing moments of this service, they'll open their heart and receive him as Savior and Lord. Father, I pray for Christians here this morning. They really need to think hard about how well they see Jesus. As they go out into the world on Monday and Tuesday, every day of the week, do they really believe that Jesus can make a difference in the world in which they live? Do they believe that Jesus may want to use them to begin making that difference in the lives of others? Help us to see just how well we see Jesus. Speak to our hearts. Father, help us to live for your glory now. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.